just like you know, animation involved, this complex may involve as you check too, so we'll see. This is where we left off. This look familiar? Y'all, where's y'all's last slide? This one here? Yeah. So we understand what markers are for. Mm -hmm. Who can tell me what are anatomical markers for? For position. To know which side of the anatomy we're doing. Yeah, because, you know, we like to think those doctors are super smart, but sometimes they're not. Any little bit of hand holding direction. I need to know what side you're x raying, what they're looking at. That's to make sure that we are confirming that that is a right hand, a right foot, a right or left knee which side of the chest we're looking at, so on and so forth. Do we ever use digitized markers? No. Why not? It's there. It's used after the thing and it's going to be correct to do it. So. Yes, yeah, so we always use what's called physical anatomical markers. And I want you guys to write that down. Put a huge star on that. I'm going to ask that question over and over again, you guys, because that has been a registry question that's been coming up over and over again as of late. And even though this technology is evolving fast and we have the capabilities to use digitized markers, it is never, at least currently in the curriculum, it is never acceptable to use a digitized marker, period. Now, when you guys get to clinic, you're gonna see a lot of techs out there forgetting to put their markers and using digital markers. I, myself, am guilty of doing that as well. <laughs> but one of the main reasons that we never wanna use a digitized marker is if an x-ray is used for a court case or a legalized case study, so on and so forth, and a judge, a jury, you know the whole gist of that. If it's a digital marker, it is not considered legal evidence. And that really applies in pediatrics. In fact, whenever I worked in pediatrics, we never were allowed to use digitized markers. And we did what was called skeletal surveys, which are abuse case study x-rays. We had to have physical markers because if a digitized marker was on that film, it would throw it out as evidence. And abuse cases often end up in courts and they use the x-rays we take as examples for the court case. So it has to be a physical marker to be considered a legal document. That's one of the main reasons there. It's a legal process. What is this over here, Valerian II? I don't have no idea. That's been there since like last week. That's a mystery. Yeah, I've never seen that before. 29 is uh, where we left off with Miss uh, Shepard. Oh, this is, the, I'm, that's patient care. This is Brad Pro. I was saying the 29 on this Oh, side. that's for Miss Shepard. Okay, okay. In case you were wondering about that. Well. Gotcha. I didn't see that yet. Thank you for pointing it out. All right, let's talk about the radiograph. So that is your word for word definition right there. You want to write that down, put a big star on it, make sure you know what a radiograph is. That's going to be the image recorded by exposing any of the image receptors to x rays, what we call a radiograph. When we do radiographs, by the way, you're going to see highlighted words throughout this text. When you see highlighted words, those are some of the main ideas you want to focus upon. Each of these procedural steps must be accurate to ensure the maximum amount of recorded image information. In other words, if we're x-raying a hand, it needs to be accurately showing a hand. If we're x-raying a foot, it needs to be accurately showing a foot, not chopping off any toes. If we're x-raying a chest, we need to see both of the lungs in full detail, completely recorded on that radiograph without any of it cut off. So when we obtain this information through our RAD procedures, through our x-rays, we're going to be able to see the presence or the absence of an abnormality or trauma. Now, every x-ray we take is not necessarily going to show anything abnormal. Sometimes they're just completely normal. <coughs> Some people think they have a broken bone, but it's maybe just a sprained ankle, for example. There's nothing broken at all. So that's why it says the presence or the absence of an abnormality or a trauma. We're going to see both of those on the radiographs. We hope for everybody that's going to show nothing because ultimately we hope that everyone's going to be healthy. Of course, we're going to see a lot of abnormality as well, whether that's a pathology, fracture, or something odd, something weird, even an artifact. Maybe someone swallowed something suspicious and they want to see it on the x-ray. That would be an abnormality on that x-ray. Of course, why do we take x-rays? Like I just said, we're the eyes for the, for the doctors, for the radiologists. We're the eyes for the ER doctors. We're assisting in that diagnosis and, of course, that treatment of the patient. We are on the front line providing those eyes for those doctors and those physicians. If I go too fast, y'all let me know. So 
I'm going to get excited and I start flying through these slides. All right, so as a radiographer, by the way, you are a radiologic technologist. I'm sure Mr. Fung has already went over that. If anyone calls you a radiologic technician, you tell them to stop mm -hmm. and say, I do not repair equipment, I run the equipment. Um, <laughs> my teachers always said, don't ever let anyone call you a radiologic technician. That is a big insult. We are radiologic technologists or we are radiographers. When we look at each of these radiographs, we have to look at these three bullet points right here. We're gonna look at the acceptability of the image features. We're gonna ensure proper radiation safety practices and I'll elaborate on these in a second. And we're gonna determine whether the objectives for performing the procedure have been met. So I wanna focus on bullet point two and three. When we say proper radiation safety practices, that is a number of different factors that we're gonna be discussing as we learn more and more about the x-ray process. Of course, when we're doing x-rays, we're delivering ionizing radiation. We want to deliver the lowest dose possible, the ALARA principle. Did you guys go over the ALARA principle already? Yeah. What does ALARA stand for? Uh, so we're gonna use optimized techniques, of the lowest KDP and the lowest mass while still obtaining a quality image. We wanna bring that exposure down. We're also gonna utilize what's called collimation. Collimation is when you bring that light film down to a smaller size. We always want to exercise collimation because the less, the less collimation we have, the less x-rays are hitting the patient. Once again, we're ensuring safety for that patient. We also want to minimize how many repeat exposures we make. If we are really bad at our job and we're taking constant repeats, we're re-exposing, 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 we're upping that dose on the patients. And of course, we try to shield our patients. Although they are, I just learned in the seminar, the curriculum is moving away from shielding, which I don't necessarily agree with, but until they officially introduce that, we're still shielding all our patients during x-rays, lead shields. Yes? So we're not going at shielding anymore? Or they're we still are, there? but they are moving away from that. Why? It's a whole other lesson. <laughs> when the time comes, I'll explain that, but I don't necessarily agree with it. Yes? So that's kind of the opposite of what they told us at the seminar. They said, but mainly abdomen and pelvis, they're not wanting to shield. All the other ones are still shielding. They're, they're having a whole bunch of mess right now with it. It's, it's a whole brouhaha. It sounds like they're it's trying to experiment with us. Pretty much. <laughs> like I said, I don't necessarily agree with it. But for now, we shield on all our x-rays unless it's going to obscure something we need to see. That's the main thing we need to remember there. Now, objectives for performing the procedure have been met. So when we say objectives, as we start learning about x-rays, we start learning about chest x-rays, abdominal x-rays, hand, feet, there's gonna be what's called evaluation criteria. We want certain pertinent anatomy to show up on that x-ray. Once again, like I said, if I'm doing a chest x-ray, a PHS, I wanna ensure that the entirety of both lungs are on that x-ray, from the apices at the top to the concentrated angles on the bottom. I wanna make sure there's no rotation of the patient's anatomy. I want to make sure all these evaluation criteria are met because I'm not going to send trash to the doctor. It needs to be a good image that they can diagnose properly for that patient. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying the objectives have been met. Objectives met. And there are hundreds upon hundreds of evaluation criteria for all these exams. We're going to learn those as we go through all the positioning. It's going to look overwhelming, but you're going to know it like the back of your hand by the time you're done with this. All right, a few more evaluation criteria to be considered. Um, presence of patient identification. Every image we take must have the proper patient identification on that image. We will start learning the AIDIT principles when we check with patients. That's where we're ensuring you have the correct patient. The last thing you want to happen is if I call for Jordan Aguilar and 10 people raise their hand because they all think they're Jordan Aguilar, and I just pick a random person to come with me. Well, they're all saying they're Jordan Aguilar. Come on, I'll just take an x-ray one of you guys. Don't do that, that's just stupid, first of all. Mm -hmm. Make sure you check and make sure you have the right patient. How do we do that? Have you guys learned that yet? What's the proper way of making sure you have the correct check. patient? Check to aid it. Well, we're doing aid it, yes, but what, what else? Someone said wristband. Name. Name. The date. Check that wristband, check the name, the date of birth, confirm you have the correct person. Make sure you double check that. Like I said, that sounded funny what I said about Jordan Aguilar, that you'd be surprised, especially because in Houston, English is not a lot of people's first language. You say Jordan Aguilar, 10 people raise their hand. I'm Jordan Aguilar. 
And you say, are you Jordan Aguilar? They all say yes. <laughs> they don't even know what you're saying. You've got to check that identification yourself or you're gonna find yourself in trouble. Um, one of the biggest things that we can do to really screw up our career and lose our job is x-raying the wrong patient. That can be a major, major big deal. So don't find yourself in that situation. What else? Proper marker placement. We're gonna learn about that when we start getting into actual projections. I'll tell you right now, Mr. Donahue's biggest pet peeve on the face of the earth is when you put your marker in anatomy. Try not to do that. That's not in your curriculum, that's a Mr. Donahue curriculum thing. Try not to put your marker in anatomy if you can avoid it. And I say that because we can inadvertently cover up a pathology with our markers if we're not careful or replace them. So you always try whenever it's possible to place your marker outside of the anatomy within your light field. We'll learn more about that as we get closer to positioning. Proper collimation, that goes in that safety practice. We always want to show, write this down by the way, every image, I mean, sorry, put a star, I know you're right, put a star by this. When we do an x-ray image, this is on the rib street as well, every x-ray image must have some evidence of collimation, even if the anatomy is filling the entire image. You just collimate just a little tiny fraction of collimation, that's considered good practice. Every image needs to show some evidence of collimation more safety practices and optimizing an image. Keep with optimi optimizing an image. Evidence of your required patient shielding. Of course, depending on what we're doing, we can't always see the evidence of that, but we try to practice that with every image. We want to shield on everything unless it's actually obscuring anatomy. And of course, absence of artifacts. Does anybody know some examples of artifacts that are really easy to miss on patients? We're going to learn more about this in patient care. Yes? The bra, yes, the bra is one of the biggest ones. Yes, we have to awkwardly get used to saying, I need you to take your bra off. That's part of being an x-ray tech. If you're not comfortable saying that, you're gonna be very comfortable saying that by the time you're through this two years. We have to also tell patients to remove things like necklaces, earrings, scrunchies, false teeth. Bobby pins. What'd you say? Bobby pins. Bobby pins, oh, those bobby pins. Lord have mercy, yes. <laughs> bobby pins are one of my arch nemesis, yes. And the lead stickers, when we have the little cardiac leads on the chest, those lead stickers, obscure anatomy. We gotta get those artifacts out of the way whenever possible. And you'll see a lot of different artifacts out there, guys. And you'll be asking patients, are you sure you took everything off? Yeah, I'm sure. You take your x-ray, there's a necklace right in the middle of the film. So you gotta check, you gotta double check, you gotta ensure these artifacts are out of the way. Yes? Um, what if a patient not necessarily neglects, but they fail to mention that they have an implant or something in, uh, before we do the x-ray and then we happen to like, oh, there's something there. So like a pacemaker or something? Pacemaker or let's say like a, a pins and something. Or... Well, in that case, like a pacemaker, that's internal. They can't remove that anyway. You would just make documentation of that. If they fail to remove any kind of artifact, you may ask them. Of course, you're going to have to repeat that image, but you need to document that you did ask the patient beforehand to remove it. Mm -hmm even though it still showed up on the x-ray. Really about documentation. It's important to document everything you do, mm -hmm. cover your tracks. You make sure you have a paper trail with everything you do. It's a very important aspect of being an x-ray technologist and always making sure you're covering your behind if anything needs to come up. If you want to say, like, why did you x-ray this person three times? Well, you look at my documentation. I did ask the patient beforehand to remove all artifacts. They refused to do so. That's why I had to obtain extra images. Make sense? Yeah, I was just trying to make sure that the dose was gonna be okay. The dose, I mean, of course, the dose is going to be more, but, I mean, you did ask them beforehand. And, of course, sometimes they're just not going to do it. Or they don't even remember that they have something there. They forget they even had an artifact there. So, underwear as well, guys. Let me tell you this right now, because people have different opinions on this. Tell your patients to take your underwear off for abdomen x-rays and pelvis x-rays. Those waistbands show up as artifacts, especially with digitized imaging. It's a lot more sharp, a lot more detailed. Those little waistbands are going to show up. You've got to ask people to take their underwear off too. Is it uncomfortable? Yes, it is. But we're going to get used to asking that of our patients. So there's tons of artifacts, tons of ways these things can show up. I mean, I've had x-rays with a Nike symbol showing up on people's <laughs> x-ray and all kinds of stuff. I've seen Victoria's Secret underwear. I mean, I've seen all of Victoria's Secrets in these x-rays. <laughs> but you gotta, you got to speak up. you got to ensure these artifacts are out of the way. Now, when we talk about the image evaluation, it requires an understanding of the anatomy. The image geometry, please put a star on these aspects, by the way. The image display characteristics and the image appearance of pathology. You guys, as we've said before, are going to become masters of anatomy within this course. You're going to know more than the doctors know. 
You're gonna know every little detail, every little landmark, every part of the human body. You're gonna be a master of it. Aside from that, we're gonna learn all the aspects of what makes an image, what affects the quality, what affects the sharpness, the contrast, the brightness. And of course, we're gonna learn all those different pathologies, how to identify them, that you'll be able to stand from 10 feet away and say that person has pneumonia, they have tuberculosis, they have a pleural effusion. You're gonna be a master of all these aspects. So we've got to be able to identify these things so we know what's normal versus abnormal, and we know what to send versus what not to send and repeat. So we're going to learn all these different aspects for these image evaluations as we move forward. All right, so when we display an image, we always, we always, we always display an image using anatomic position. What is anatomic position? Well, if you look at that picture right there, that young lady is standing in anatomic position. Anatomic position is when I'm standing like this with my palms outward and I'm on my toes. This is anatomic position. It's what we base all our images on. It's how we know which is right versus left. When you look at an image, an x-ray, think of a person facing you like I'm facing you. Have you guys seen Ray Grass where the right's on the left side and left's on the right side? You know what I'm talking about with the markers? Because we're looking at it from an anatomic position. Like I'm looking at you. If I'm looking at an x-ray, that person's looking straight at you. Therefore, this is the left side. This is the right side. Left hand, right hand. Does that make sense? We base it all on the anatomic position. The only ones that we have exceptions on are the hands, the wrists, the feet, and the toes. Those are hung differently, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. But other than those four, everything is based upon anatomic position where we're identifying the right versus left positions on radiographs. And these are viewed from perspective of the tube with distal ends towards the ceiling. Anatomic position is a key aspect to know, guys. I've seen people make so many mistakes when they get the right and left mixed up. Start thinking backwards. Always think of that radiograph as a person facing you. They're looking at you through the radiograph. That's how you'll always be able to determine your rights versus left. It's the patient's left, the patient's right. It's also how we determine laterality and medial positions. We'll start going over different terms like lateral versus medial, things like that. We base that upon anatomic position as well. In other words, this is the lateral aspect of the hand, medial aspect of the hand. Lateral aspect of the leg, medial aspect of the leg. And we'll go over that in more detail in the next chapter. Are you doing okay out there? Yeah. Making sense so far? There it is again, guys. Now this person is standing, this guy, this muscle man, he's standing flat-footed. But he's got the palms out. One thing to remember, once again, guys, when you say anatomic position, typically it's when the person's on their toes with the palms out. This is actual anatomic position. So that's the one thing that's missing from that image. I apologize. Okay, so like I said, guys, imagine the patient's head's right here. They're looking at you. This is the patient's left, the patient's right. Your rights and lefts are going to be reverse, which you would normally think. That's what we say about anatomic position. And when I said the only exception is the hands, of course, anatomic position, when we're thinking of anatomic position, the hands are down, right? Mm -hmm. But for hands and feet and the other examples I gave you, we hang those differently. As you can see, a hand is hung up, a foot is also hung up in the same position, forearms, elbows, so on and so forth. We're gonna hang those in different ways because extremities have a little bit of an exception to them. And that'll make more sense as we move through this as well. Yes? Yeah, this is Monod Pet Peeves again. So y'all see that tip of that marker in that clavicle? Mm -hmm. Don't do that, that drives me nuts. That's not in your curriculum, that's in Mr. Donahue's curriculum. Because I always say, what if there's a, what if there's a small chance that you put that marker over that clavicle and there was a fracture there and you covered it up? Who's gonna be in trouble? You're gonna be in trouble. I always say, better safe than sorry. That's something they were really hardcore with at Texas Children's with pediatrics, so it's kind of always stuck with me. But I think it applies to everybody. It's, you know, it's, it's um, it's just a safer practice, in my opinion, to make sure you're not in the anatomy, unless you can't avoid it. Like abdomen sometimes you can't avoid it because you have to put it in the anatomy a little bit, but you'll see more of that as we move forward. Is, was the image on the left properly collimated? This image on the left does not show any evidence of collimation. How could you tell? One way you can tell in an x-ray image if there's evidence of collimation is if there's a little white edge around the corners of the film. It's one of the easiest ways to see if a, if a tech actually collimated a little bit. So we'll learn to identify that more moving forward. And this one over here, I think this is actually cropped. That doesn't look they complement a bit in this film. But they used the digital marker. They did. Good eye. 
They did, big no-no. Do we ever do that? No, we do not. You're gonna see a lot of images that look like that, but we always want to use the physical markers. By the way, y'all see these little three dots here in that circle? Those are the beads. Uh, like this one. He's yeah, he's he's big. Big. Oh, he's oh, you already learned about this? Yes. Yes. Oh, I was looking forward to talking about that. <laughs> who, who, who spoiled it, Mr. Fong? Yeah, yeah. he has it. Yeah. It was Mr. Marcus. Fong. Yeah. Y'all already know what that means. Okay, showing gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's hear your explanation, explanation about it, sir. It's the same one. Nothing special. But gravity, we had fun. I've already lost my enthusiasm for that. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Required ID. So, as we talked about, whenever we look at an image, it needs a certain amount of patient identification. We must have the date. We got to know when we took the X-ray. We must have the patient's name or ID number. You see it says name or ID number, by the way right or left side marker, and the institution identity. These are the four required parts of identification that we need on a radiograph before it's a legalized document. You'll see it displayed a number of ways, different ways throughout um, PACs and different facilities, but they need at least these four bullet points. Now, you'll see more than those four sometimes, but these are the four that we must have. If any of those are missing, that would not be a legalized medical document. Question. Yes. Uh, on the uh, previous slide, you said if it shows too much white around the border, or I guess it means it wasn't properly collimated. So when you see a little white edge around a the white film, edge. it okay. just shows that there was evidence of collimation. That's okay. really the way it looks like. Um, not every image, of course, but most commonly you'll see a little white edge, and that's just evidence that they actually attempted to collimate. Okay. Okay. What's yes. the institution ID? Is it the MR number? Or? Institution ID can be like, yeah, you brought the ID? No. Institution ID would be like what facility was it done at? Oh, the name? Like, like Bentob, Texas Children's, MDR, so. Baldwin Radiology. Baldwin Radiology, Baldwin Radiology, Radiology yes. Yeah. So we need to know where that was done. Because they send films all over the world. Patients move around, people move, they take their documents with them. They need to know where that was obtained. That's something when I used to work at Texas Children's, we used to get films all the time. We'd actually have to contact people constantly because they would forget to have the, I don't know what these facilities were doing, but they wouldn't have their identification on there. We didn't know where it came from. We couldn't accept it. We'd have to have them run it through again, make sure they actually had an identification of where that came from. They could tell us all day it came from MD Anderson, but if it didn't say it on there, we could not accept it. It wasn't a legal document. So very important to have those four required aspects. Okay, so all the following are required ID on a radiograph image except for what, guys? Did you pay attention? Which one of those doesn't fit? Very good, referring physician's name. So many people think that you have to have the doctor's name on a radiograph. You actually do not. But we do need those four right there. Now, this, once again, does that mean that there is only gonna be those four aspects? No, they'll put the physician's name, they'll put all kinds of info on there. But that's the only four that we must have. We must have those four. Careful, I could ask a tricky question on that. Kind of start thinking of those questions in your head. That's a great trick question. Oh, that's, that's a great idea for next week. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know. A technique chart must include all the following except what? I know. Did y'all talk about technique charts D. last week? D. Do y'all know what a technique chart is? Uh, it's just showing your different exams, showing your KP, your mass, things like that. What techniques you would set on the control panel. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know what I'm talking about, which one of those doesn't fit? You said pathology. A. Pathology type. That's a great learning moment there, guys. You're going to see a lot of stuff you don't understand. What they call a very efficient test taking technique is, if you have no idea what the question's asking you, let's say, I, you're saying, I have no idea what a technique chart is, but I kind of know what KUP is, AEC, grids, that sounds like it fits, but pathology type, sounds like a completely different thing. That's the one that doesn't fit, that'd be the most educated guess for that answer. We're gonna learn test taking techniques like that as we move forward. Process of elimination. Process of elimination, yes sir. Very, very important aspect to learn, guys, because I still to this day find stuff that I don't recognize. I wish I could say I knew it all, but I sure don't. And none of us here knows it all. 
but we can make logical, educated guesses on questions we don't understand. All right, so about obesity, you're gonna have a lot of obese patients out there. So, of course, especially in the United States, guys, um, obesity has increased, say here, double in the last 15 years. We define that as an increase in body weight by an excessive accumulation of fat. We measure that by using BMIs or body mass indexes. And when we talk about the BMI numbers, if the readout is 30 to 39.9, that's considered obese. 40 plus is gonna be what we call morbidly obese. Now, why are we learning about obesity? Because it's very important when it comes to setting the proper techniques, making sure we don't break our tables and making sure that we transport and move the patients properly. Because you can wreck your back like you would not believe in this career if you do not do things properly. I can attest to that. And while you're writing that down, let me tell you something, guys. Get used to pulling the, get used to raising that table up to your level. Don't be working like this. I see people, I, I won't tell you if I see you in lab and you're working like this, I'll say you're hurting my back. I'm watching you, you're hurting my back while I watch you. Don't do that to your back. You're gonna wreck your muscles if you keep doing that. Work at your level. Always raise that table up properly. I'm off subject here, but that's a good thing to remember. Do not hurt yourself. This is a very physically demanding career. And there's proper ways to move patients, of course. You can learn that in patient care as well. You always want to try to get a team when you're moving patients. All right, so communication is going to be key, not only for obese patients, but for all patients. We need to learn what we call empathetic communication. What's it mean to be empathetic? To be sympathetic or to, to, to realize other people's feelings. Even if you're just like a really cold person and you don't really care about people's feelings, you can at least pretend that you understand their feelings and you're understanding their pain, you're understanding what they're going through, you're communicating properly, you're working with them, not against them. Empathetic communication is going to be key in getting patients to cooperate with you. Because when you're in a hospital and you're not feeling good, you're not really wanting to cooperate with anybody. You're in pain, you don't care. Do this as painless as possible. Get me out of here. I don't want to be here. But there are different ways we can communicate. There are different things that we can say to have patients cooperate with us instead of working against us. Avoid mentioning weight. Last thing you want to do is mention anybody's weight. Big faux pas, none of us want to do that. Explain that you're going to have required personnel come assist you to safely move and or transfer the patient. Don't try to move these obese patients yourself. Like I said, these be a team effort or you're going to really hurt yourself. Now, one thing I want you guys to start thinking about, you'll probably learn this in patient care, is I want you to learn the power of the phrase, I need you to. Whenever you talk to a patient, it doesn't matter what kind of patient we're talking about, if you say, um, can you please help me? Or would you like to move over here? or um, do you think you can move over to this table? What's wrong with the way I'm saying that? Okay, I'm giving them Maybe options, right? To do it. If I'm giving somebody an option, they're probably gonna say no, right? I'm hurting too bad. But psychological trick that you can use is the power of the word need. I need you to move over to this table. I need you to get in this wheelchair. I need you to move to your side. Even if they're giving you a little pushback, psychologically, they're gonna be more cooperative. I'm telling you there's power in that phrase. I need you to. Trust me, don't give them options. That's gonna work against you. I know we're trying to be nice. Oh, I mean, will it be okay if you move over this way? Would you like to sit here or there? Um, you know, you can turn your hand like this if you like, but it's okay if you can't. No, 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 no. You're gonna give yourself a huge headache being that way. I need, and it sounds like you're being like rough or stern. You can still do it if they, wait, I need you to turn your head to the left. To the, Side. I need you to put your hand flat down. I need you to lay on your side. The power of the word I need you to is a powerful word I'm telling you. It works. Okay, so big key factor, guys, for um, obese patients, make sure your table can support the patient's weight. Every x-ray table has a weight limit that varies per brand and facility. If a patient exceeds the table's weight, you do not want to move that table around. You can still put the patient on the table, but you don't want to float the table around. You want to say when, I, when you say floating, did y'all do that in the lab where you float yeah. the table? If they're exceeding that weight, if you float that table and they're exceeding the weight, you're going to break the table or you have a danger of breaking the table. If you break that table, you shut the whole room down, and you cost your, your facility a lot of money. Don't do it. Um, I think every x-ray tech you talk to can attest to that happening at some point or almost happening. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, does the... Uh yeah, they'll tell you what the, the uh, maximum weight is, yes. And it does vary, yeah. 
So make sure you know what that maximum weight is. And you can ask your techs on hospital, they should know. Um, always make sure you have adequate personnel to help you. Look guys, as a technologist, you're gonna have times where you're by yourself. Recruit people to help you. You're gonna work with some grumpy nurses, grumpy doctors. I worked night shift a lot when I was an x-ray tech. And I might be the only tech in that, in that room for the whole night. I tell you what, if I have a big heavy patient, I'm not doing it by myself. I already got a bad back for my kids. I'm not gonna kill myself worse on a patient. I make sure those nurses come back and help me move that patient. And I will not do anything else until they come help me. Are they gonna be upset sometimes? Yeah, but I'm not hurting my back. They have to come help you. Get people to come help you, call people to help you. Because ultimately we have to get these exams done. And if they're a little, there's a little bit of pushback, they're gonna come help you eventually. Now, typically, in most areas you'll have more techs around you. Always don't be afraid to ask someone to help you. I cannot say enough, guys. You'll hurt your back. You will wreck your back if you don't ask for assistance whenever you need assistance. Communicate each part of the transfer process. Explain what you're doing. One thing you're going to learn with patient care is we're telling people what we're doing while we're doing it. Don't just walk up to a person and start moving their their seat around. Don't just be like, all right, beep, beep, beep. I mean. Don't do that, that's, that's terrible. That's terrible patient care. You're gonna be hurting your patients. Especially if they're fractured and they're in pain, they're gonna be screaming at you and you've just lost your connection with the patient. They're not gonna be cooperative. All right, sir, uh, my name is John. I'm gonna do your x-rays today. Now, first thing, I need you to put your hand flat on the table like this. I'm showing him what I'm doing myself and if he needs help, I'm gonna direct this thing. I'm gonna move your hand right here, sir, to better center. Please put your hand flat. There you go, awesome. Now, I need you to hold really still, don't move. Go take my picture. All right, sir, great, you did an awesome job. Now, what I need you to do next is I need you to make an okay symbol for me. Now, I'm just gonna move your finger slightly and we'll move your hand up a little bit like this. Perfect, hold still, I need you to hold still for me, don't move, boom, x-ray. I'm communicating, I'm talking slow, I'm explaining what I'm doing, and I am even mimicking. You know, there's power in mimicry. Sometimes if you show a patient what to do, I mean, people psychologically are gonna mimic what you do. If you smile at somebody, typically they're gonna smile back. If you're frowning at somebody, they're probably gonna frown back at you too. If you're grumpy with somebody, they're probably gonna be grumpy back at you. You know, my dog just died and I'm depressed. If I'm depressed to my patient, they're probably gonna be even more depressed back at me. People will mimic your actions. If you're showing them what to do with the hands and the feet yourself, they'll wanna mimic that even if they don't even realize they're doing it. Uh, human beings, the human mind, psychology, it's quite fascinating. There's power in mimicry, power in the word I need you to. You're gonna learn that as you move forward. It works, I'm telling you. And of course, provide support and assistance to maximize patient comfort and security. Once again, communication. Some people, they feel like they're gonna fall off these tables. Ensure they're safe, talk to them. Um, give them some little pillows on their sides. It helps them feel better. Give them a blanket if they're cold. Hospitals are cold, guys. I spend most of my life freezing cold. I'm always cold. Offer warm blankets to your patients. Those are typically readily available everywhere you go. Those little things, those little um, aspects of patient care, once again, they're gonna be more cooperative. They're gonna work with you if you're doing everything you can to ensure they're safe and they're comfortable during these procedures. And of course, guys, um, and this is not just for obese patients, never prod your patients unnecessarily. We're gonna learn what's uh, called palpation. Did y'all learn what palpation is yet? Palpation means that you gotta get used to touching people. In this career field, does anybody like to touch people? It can be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be touching people a lot. Why? Because there are anatomical landmarks all over the body that we have to palpate. This example is the iliac crests on your pelvis. To do an abdominal x-ray, you have to dig your hand in there and palpate the top of that pelvis. Now, once again, communication. If I walk up to Jordan and I just stick my hand on his waist and dig my hand in there, not only is he probably gonna shout at me, he's gonna be like, what in the world are you doing? Really? <laughs> Don't just walk up to somebody and stick your hand on their body and start poking on them. Um, you might get slapped, you might get cursed out, and you might be thought as a weird, creepy weirdo. Once again, communication is key. Jordan, is it all right if, well, don't say if it's all right. I need to, I, yeah, see, I just made a mistake. I need to fill the top of your pelvis to get a good x-ray of your abdomen. I'm gonna put my hand on your pelvis and palpate. Well, don't say palpate either. I don't know what that means. I'm gonna fill your, pelvis to center my x-ray properly. So you're telling what you're doing before you do it. Just be careful with that. Don't start touching people. Don't start poking people. Communicate everything you're doing. Even if it feels like you're being redundant, it's gonna help a patient feel more secure because especially when you're sick, you don't want someone touching all over you. That's just weird. But we have to do it for our career field. That's what we call palpation on those different landmarks.
Uh, we will learn alternative palpation points in positioning. For example, we use the uh, C7 on the back of the neck and we make a little symbol with our hands like this to center for a chest X-ray. If a patient's lying on their back, I can't access that point of the body. I have to use an alternative. An alternative to using the C7 would be the jugular notch. We'll learn how to do that. There's always alternatives to different palpation points in case of different situations. We're gonna learn all those as well. We, use the, we only use these as alternatives when the traditional method's not possible because the traditional method will always be the best, but these alternatives exist just in case we can't access that normal area. So for obese patients, for example, I might not be able to find that iliac crest. There might be so much tissue there that I just can't find anything. I don't even know what I'm poking. But there's an alternative. We can use the pubic symphysis. Where's the pubic symphysis? The bottom of the pelvis. That lines up with the trochanters of our femur. We can locate the trochanter of the femur and line that up with the pubic symphysis and center properly to that abdomen using that alternative landmark. We're going to learn these different alternatives per patients, per patient size, and per situations that we may face. The word is prod me. Touch. Prod means, oh, prod means that you just mark. touch somebody without their permission. Like if I just walk up to you and I put my hands on you, I'm poking on you, I'm prodding you. Oh, Don't do that. All right, this is not the end, by the way, just the end of chapter one. Mm -hmm. But let's take a break. You know, I see your brain's already frying. Let's take a 10 minute break, get you some coffee, get you some water, bathroom break, and we will pick back up with chapter two in about 10 minutes. Be back here at 918. 10 minutes. <laughs>